Hi there, thanks for tuning into the executive series. Today I'm speaking with Meg O'Neill, who of course is the CEO of Woodside Energy. Meg, always good to talk to you. Great to be here, Tom. Uh, look, you've just released your result in the last day, so thanks for making the time to, to chat. I suppose just looking at the result from a high level, you know, what stands out is that it's been a challenging half as far as energy prices have been concerned. Uh, oil prices have fallen by about 25%. Mm. Uh, that has not deterred you from an 80% payout ratio. Uh, it really highlights the discipline mm. that you have when it comes to paying your shareholders. Well, thanks for the observation, Tom. I think you stole my thunder there. <laughs> so one of the things that uh, Woodside prides ourselves on and we get very clear and consistent feedback from our shareholders on is how much they value the dividend. Uh, we've, of course, many of our shareholders are ordinary Australian households who hold Woodside either directly or through their superannuation funds. Uh, and place great value on the fully franked dividend that we're paying. So when we think about how we manage the business, uh, we always take care of the credit rating. We wanna make sure we've got that strong balance sheet and we wanna make sure that we can return value to our shareholders. So very pleased with the 80% payout ratio this year. And obviously, you know, the, um, the bottom line reflects the cost discipline as well. So how are things looking from a cost vantage point in the resource space because it wasn't that long ago where things were looking a little bit unwieldy, but they seem to have come under control a little bit recently. I'm really pleased with the work that our teams have done to ensure that our base business is delivering. You know, Last year we had our record production and that reflects the value of the full year contribution of the BHP petroleum yep. assets. So 187 million barrels of oil equivalent over the year, fantastic big numbers. Um, but it, I think it's important to peel back and see how we've done that. LNG reliability, world-class 98%. Our unit production cost, we kept flat year on year in an inflationary environment. Again, really proud of all the hard work the teams have put in to deliver those results. And that underpins the strong financials. It's almost um, alchemy to be able to do that. But you know, you've know, you spoken, uh, once we're speaking about strategy, you've uh, spoken about uh, delivering through the energy transition. So I suppose for the average person to give them an understanding where you see where we are in that transition journey, are we, um, we're only in the early stages, aren't we? We are. Um, look, there's been tremendous global investment in renewables, uh, and so there is progress being made. But the world's energy mix today is still about 80% uh, met by coal, oil, and natural gas. And that's not really different from where it was a decade ago. So despite all of this investment in renewables, there's still going to be a long way to go to be able to wind down some of these more emissions intensive sources of energy. And as we look at our business, we've got uh, a lot of confidence in LNG's role in helping meet the world's energy needs while also pulling down emissions. And so, um in the context of meeting your emissions targets, you know, that's always uh, something that you highlight quite strenuously in your updates. It is. Um, we recognize as an energy company, there's a lot of attention on us and our emissions performance. So we've set ourselves challenging goals to reduce our, what we call net equity scope one and two emissions. So these are, this is our share of the emissions from the facilities that we own. Uh, we want to reduce it by 15% by 2025 and 30% by 2030. And I was very pleased that last year we reduced uh, our emissions by 12.5% measured versus that baseline. Uh, tell me about how the BHP acquisition um, performed in real terms over the course of the last half because you know, it's now the rubber's really hitting the road, isn't it? It is. So uh, we brought the organizations together in uh, June 2022. So we've now got about 18 months of runtime. Uh, great assets, great human capability. Uh, really pleased with the work that we've done to deliver on the synergies from the merger. You know, we captured all of our targeted synergies seven months in, so yep. $400 million US in savings. And we continue to find ways to improve the value of the business. Uh, we've just moved to a common computing platform. So we've converted the two legacy systems into one enterprise resource planning system. 
uh, I think that is going to deliver cost savings as well once we uh, are able to get up and running on that new platform. That's impressive to be able to do that in a relatively short space of time. It's been a tremendous effort yep. to get to a common platform, but we knew we had to do it. Yep. You know, we couldn't keep running with these two legacy systems and the poor accounts were having to do a whole bunch of things with spreadsheets. We've got to get a more efficient way of running the business. So pleased that we have that platform. And I think the year ahead will be a year where we figure out, you know, how do we really get things humming on this new platform? So I suppose, you know, one of the things that stands out when you read broker reports, they're um, so reluctant to be flattering, but one of the things that stands out is that all of your growth projects are uh, on time in terms of the, the delivery timetable. So um, are there any risks that you're mindful of? I mean, obviously, you know, uh, there's, there can be blemishes from time to time. Is there anything that you focused on particularly? Uh, look, major projects, uh, that's a hard business. You're trying to pull together equipment and materials from many different suppliers. It's tens of thousands of tons of steel. Uh, I'm really pleased with how our teams are doing on staying focused on delivering, uh, first off, safe outcomes, uh, second off, quality outcomes, and then third priority is on time and uh, on budget. Um, so excited about how we're tracking. Our first of the major projects is due to start producing later this year. So the Sangamar development offshore Senegal, we're looking at first oil in the middle of 2024. Um, so be really pleased to move out of the construction phase and into the producing phase. Indeed, the pictures look uh, very impressive. When um, talking about growth projects, Scarborough, mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously in that conversation, what was the motivation to um, go for the additional sell down when it came to Scarborough, given the fact it's such an important part of the next 20 years when it comes to Woodside? Scarborough is an important asset for us. It's one of our crown jewels. Um, we've probably had three in our life. Northwest Shelf was jewel number one, Pluto, and now Scarborough is, uh, is an incredibly important asset for us. Uh, when the BHP merger was completed, we had 100% of the offshore, which is a fair amount of risk concentration. Uh, and we wanted to be really disciplined in our search for the right partner. What I'm excited about is we've now announced bringing in two partners, LNG Japan and JIRA, who are top tier Japanese companies. And, and what's really exciting is it's not just Scarborough equity that they're buying into, they've both signed up for additional LNG offtake and they've signed up to collaborate on new energy. So again, as we think about energy transition, as we think about how our Japanese customers are going to change their energy mix, we now have two top tier partners who are gonna work on those important questions with us. I mean, it's probably underexplored the value that a partner like that can bring to the table. What specifically um, do they bring? Well, Adira is one of the world's biggest LNG players, one of the world's biggest energy players altogether. Uh, very significant, strong relationships in Japan with the Japanese government. And, you know, as Japan thinks about how they evolve their energy mix to decarbonize, JIRA is going to be a key player there. Uh, the fact that we have a strategic relationship with them uh, means we'll be able to have a, a seat at the table and be actively involved in those conversations about how do we create something out of nothing. Indeed. So. Um in the energy space at the moment, uh, M&A is a, a really big theme. And uh, with the amount of uh, free cash flow that you've got uh, available at the moment, it's um, probably a, an important part of your job to see value emerging. Um, I suppose it's impossible to get away from the Santos question. You must be exhausted from um, trying to put this to one side. Uh, how, did, how did the two uh, organizations end up in a conversation? I'll take it back to our strategy. Our strategy is to thrive through the energy transition. And we've said we're going to focus on a couple of different commodities, deep water oil, LNG, and new energy products. Santos has a very significant LNG portfolio. And so that was what uh, opened the conversation around if we can bring two uh, great Australian LNG companies together, there should be additional value uh, unleashed. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we weren't able to make the deal land and uh, we've, we're going our separate ways. Look, we're really excited about the portfolio we have today. We've got three major projects under execution yep. uh, and we've got good opportunities in the hopper. We've got uh, Browse and Sunrise, which the Australian market knows pretty well. Uh, we've also got Calypso, which is a gas field in Trinidad and Tobago. 
a, a nation that's very supportive of oil and gas development and in fact has built their whole economy around uh, gas fueling their industry. Um, so we've got great opportunities in the portfolio uh, and we're focused on executing this, the strategy that we have today. Look, I'm, I'm only asking again because there'll be people who um, just won't be um, dissuaded from the potential of talks being revived, but mm -hmm. you know, is there any possibility that um, you can get back to the table for a fruitful discussion? I don't think so. Look, okay. I think we've got uh, clarity on what we need to deliver to continue to return value to our shareholders through the cycle, um, and that's what we're focused on. Meg, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Tom. And thank you very much for joining us for the Executive Series.